Okay, so video two on uh, before you were mine looking at the second two stanzas. So, um, as I said in the first video, the first two stanzas focus on the mother before she was a mother. Um, and the second two stanzas, uh, there's a tonal shift. Um, so we're going to put in a volta in a minute. Uh, because we begin to look in a nostalgic way at how the mother's life changes when she becomes a mother. So um, I'm just going to indicate there that there's a tonal shift and therefore a volta between these two stanzas and we will find examples of how the tone becomes slightly different um, as we go through. Okay, so I'll read you stanza three. The decade ahead of my loud, possessive yell was the best one, eh? I remember my hands in those high-heeled red shoes, relics, and now your ghost clatters toward me over George Square till I see you, clear as scent, under the tree with its lights, and whose small bites on your neck, sweetheart? So... <coughs> Um, one way that we can pick out this slight tonal shift from this carefree and joyful and celebratory tone that you get at the beginning is this semantic field. It's just not a huge semantic field, but I think there's enough to, to warrant it to do with um, death. So we've got a ghost and relics. semantic field there and what has died is the freedom and the youth of the mother so it's a kind of metaphor so freedom and youth are dead and what has been born in its place is motherhood now, I want to look at relics separately uh, to ghost because a relic, as well as being something that is um, an object that survives from the past, it often has a religious connotation, so um, something that belongs to uh, or belonged to a holy person when they were alive. And I think this is somewhere where we pick up some similarities um, with litany, sorry my mind went blank there for the, the title of the other poem, some similarities with litany because litany is a prayer and you'll remember from litany that Duffy was suggesting that the woman, these 50s housewives, um, which is what her mum was about to become, she was young, she was about to get married and, um, and have a child, these 50s housewives would um, view the kind of consumption of material possessions in a, a religious way it was um, kind of uh, something sacred to climb that social ladder. But actually here, what is sacred are the high-heeled red shoes. So before she takes this shift into um, marriage and motherhood and what will become religious, what is sacred to her is this symbol of her youth, the symbol of fun and going out and being provocative, which we can uh, kind of get from the symbolism of the high heeled shoes being red. So let's break that down because that's quite a lot. So we've got in, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, in the word relic, we've got a kind of sacred association with the mother's youth. And why sacred? Well, she held these memories sacred, but also potentially to the poetic voice. Her mother is a sacred figure. We know the closeness that is between uh, the two of them. So perhaps the poetic voice views her mother as sacred, such as the bond between them. And then what I was going to go on to do here is talk about the symbolism of 
the shoes being high heeled and red. So I'm going to make this quite uh, a short note. So this is symbolic of her youth. There we go. So obviously high heels, suggesting it's not practical, it's not something that she would need to wear when she was a mother and running around after her child. And red, the kind of symbolism of eroticism or uh, red lipstick perhaps. There's another link with litany, the mothers maintain the redness. Uh, it's just it's in their lips and in a slightly more um, mundane way than wearing high heeled shoes. So there's some nice rich links there with Litany and the way the poetic voice sees her mother. Um, but what she's remembering is playing with the shoes, uh, the way that young children often will dress up in their parents' clothes. She's putting her hands into the shoes of her mother, um, almost to illustrate how how small she is in comparison that she can just fit her hands in. And she's, uh, I'm gonna just go back now to the, um, to the first line. There's references to time again. You'll see, well, you, some of you have written about time in the last two poems. Time comes up again and again with Duffy. She explores how we remember things and how time will change our memories or perhaps make them a bit more um, either rose tinted or perhaps uh, unreliable. But again, she refers to time. The first line is I'm 10 years away. And then again, a reference to the decade, the decade of the mother's um, youth, obviously her kind of late teens to her late twenties. And then she had her child. So, I'm going to pick this up here as a reference back to line one. So we've got repetition again of uh, time reference, not an adverbial, um, just a reference to time. And that just serves to emphasise how much um, things can change over time. She's gone from spending time with her friends, laughing and joking, wearing red high-heeled shoes, into a very different uh, time, which there's then characterised, we'll come on to in a minute, by the possessive yell of the child. So this emphasises that time can change a person's life quite significantly. Um, and in this case, it has changed from being carefree to being characterised, as I just said, by the possessive yell of the child. So possessive yell, I'm just going to highlight that there as a noun phrase. But I'm not going to say anything else because I think probably we've got enough notes now on the idea of possession that's come up a couple of times before. So it's just more of the image of the child being wanting the mother all to themselves and wanting to kind of consume that person that used to be an individual and now is someone's mum. Um, and then the, the end, the, Duffy ends the line with um, uh, the decade ahead of my loud possessive yell was the best one, A. Eh? And then that's picked up again, that rhetorical question is picked up in the final line of this stanza um, when she says, and now your ghost clatters toward me over George Square till I see you clear as scent under the tree with its lights and whose small bites on your neck, sweetheart. So let's pick up those rhetorical questions. Okay. And I think they serve a similar purpose, at least in my eyes, to this point up here you know in stanza two we were saying that the verbs knew and reckon were about trying to kind of attempt to claim a closeness with the mother i think these questions do a similar thing so the poetic voice is, is asking the mother indirectly questions that she can't answer so the time before the child was born was the best and who has bitten on your neck, so who has given you love bites. So I think again this is about creating a closeness 
and a dialogue between the mother and the child. Now this time, it's not that she can't ask them because she's not born, because at, at, at this point we've said there's been a change and, and now the um, poetic voice has been born. It's more perhaps that she wouldn't ask those questions or she would be afraid to. So um, I'm going to leave that up to you to think. I think it's more that she would maybe be embarrassed to ask those questions. So either afraid or embarrassed. Okay, so she imagines in this line, she's, she's remembering the high heel shoes and then she's imagining her mum uh, as, a, as a young woman clattering towards me over George Square, that's a, a bit in Glasgow, um, near lots of pubs and things. And then she's seeing her, not literally, but in her imagination, clear as scent under the tree with its lights and whose small bites on your neck. So I'm going to pick out this simile, clear as scent. And I want you to think about this image here small bites on your neck. So I referred to them as love bites earlier. But I want you to think about why Duffy would choose those words to describe what's on the neck of the mother when she was young, before she had become a mother. So I'm going to pick out this simile. And we've seen, because almost every poem that we've looked at so far has been about memory in some way. So whether that's memory of a loved one that's now uh, and not in a relationship uh, with the speaker anymore, or whether that's, that's memories of childhood or memories of parents. Memory is, is quite important. And we've seen a couple of times memory being linked to smell, how the scent of something is really evocative of memory, and if you smell something, uh, it can kind of take you back to a time and a place where you last smelled that. That picks up that idea again. So memory is really strong and smell can evoke memory. And the, um, such is the desire of the poetic voice to be able to know what her mother was like before she was born. She's saying that it's as if it's a memory coming back to her. Now it can't be her memory because she's imagining her mother before she was born. But she's so desperate to know what her mother was like, it, she's presenting it almost as, as her own memory. And yes, I want you to tell me about this uh, word choice here, small bites. Okay, so the final stanza um, it kind of explores, um, rather than memories of the mother um, after she had had children, it's more about the memories that the poetic voice actually has of her mother. So she says, cha-cha-cha, you teach me the steps on the way home from mass, stamping stars from the wrong pavement. Even then I wanted the bold girl winking in Portobello, somewhere in Scotland before I was born. That glamorous love lasts, where you sparkle and waltz and laugh before you were mine. That's the bit that always gets me to well up, but I've managed to stay strong. You'll be very proud of me. So um, there's kind of contrasts in the stanza between the life of the mother now. So, for example, taking her child to mass, uh, performing a kind of uh, a role that society would expect of a mother, you know, taking her child to church and, and teaching her uh, right from wrong teaching her child to dance and then that contrasts with the sparkle and the waltz and the laugh that characterised the woman when she was young before she was a mother. So I'm going to pick out some of these and explore them as a contrast. So I'm going to explore the idea of uh, teaching her the steps on the way home from mass and then I'm going to contrast that sparkle and waltz and laugh. So, I'm going to pick this out as a pattern and some juxtaposition. So, pattern of verbs, if we ignore a uh, mass, because mass is a noun, um, pattern of verbs, 
and then the juxtaposition of the mass and the teaching with the sparkling, the waltzing and the laughing. So we've got a couple of things, oh, sorry, a couple of things going on in that annotation there. So the juxtaposition shows is very simply that her life has changed. Her her life is now characterised by by teaching things to her child and attending uh, mass and it is not characterised anymore by sparkling, waltzing and laughing. So the juxtaposition shows that life has changed. And the um, I'm going to explore the pattern of verbs actually by adding in the synthetic listing, sparkle and waltz and laugh. So we've got synthetic listing, because there is no comma, it's a proper synthetic list. And that is just a really celebratory end to the poem, sparkle, laugh and waltz. So it ends on a, a note that celebrates the life of the woman as in her own right rather than just her life as being a mother to her child so a really celebratory tone celebrates her life as a woman and an individual And the celebratory tone suggests that the poetic voice wants to celebrate this, that there's something appealing to her about thinking about her mother before she was born. It doesn't negate the sense that she feels possessive or close to her mother, but clearly there's something and, and we um, will pick that up over here. She really is attracted to the image of her mother um, as being young, perhaps she's at that age when she's trying to kind of understand her mother as a person. Maybe she's uh, reaching kind of late teens. That's often when you start to kind of your relationship with your parents changes. So the poetic voice clearly wants to see her mother as more than uh, more than a mother and as a woman in her own right. So there's a change in the poetic voice there, I think. And we can pick that up, uh, the idea up uh, in this verb here. Even then I wanted the bold girl winking in Portobello. Um, I'm just going to pick out that line. I wanted the bold girl winking in Portobello. So the poetic voice is saying that when her mother would be walking her home from mass and teaching her how to dance, she wanted, she wished that her mother was still that young, glamorous person, the bold, winking girl. And she she was desperate for that back. She wanted it. There's something quite strong about that verb. Um, I'm just going to pick up the noun phrase, bold, winking girl. Uh, in Portobello, because the Portobello being referred to is um, is in London. So uh, this is an image of her mother going out of, which wouldn't have been that common at the time, leaving Scotland, maybe going on a holiday down to London or going to visit friends, and perhaps there's in a picture of her mother winking in this kind of quote-unquote exotic place. But now she is just somewhere in Scotland. So this noun phrase, bold, winking girl in Portobello, really presents the mother as um, a kind of exciting and um, almost rebellious figure. We get that rebellion from the, the hiding reference in stanza two as well. So an exciting and rebellious mother figure that the poetic voice maybe that's who she, who she sees herself becoming and that's why she wants to remember her mother like this uh, so wants uh, to see her mother as
across these things. Let's do a little arrow back up there, so I don't have to repeat my annotation. So what I want you to, to think about in this final stanza is uh, this part of this sentence. So you teach me the steps on the way home from Mass, stamping stars from the wrong pavement particularly interested in why she would describe the pavement as wrong. There's a reference to a pavement earlier on, but I want to leave this quite open and really let you explore that. You can also, if you want, add to it the stamping stars. You can take the entire phrase, but I particularly want you to think about why the pavement would be wrong now that she is older and a mother. And I'm going to finish aptly on the very last word. So the poem ends on the possessive pronoun that is in the title. And I think this is the, she repeats before you were mine. It's in, my oh goodness, where is it? Here and here. So this is the third example of the possessive pronoun. And often last lines or last words of poems can kind of encapsulate it. So it goes back to what we said at the title. Even though this is a poem about remembering your mother and imagining her life before you, it is at its heart a story of the poetic voice and how desperate she is to understand her mother, how desperate she is to feel close to her, how desperate she is to see her mother as more glamorous and more exciting than she was as a mother. So this just reaffirms that this poem is about the poetic voice. And all these memories and questions and the thoughts she has about her mother actually say more about their relationship than they do about the mother herself. So it's about the poetic voice and her relationship with her mother. Rather than being about the mother on her own. Okay, I didn't cry, that was a success. Um, so you have got wrong pavement, small bites, thousand eyes, right walk home, Marilyn and Ben from the waste to explore in this poem.